you write about modeling of uh, mathematical cognition. So let me first ask about mathematics in general. Um, I, there, there's a paper uh, titled Parallel Distributed Processing Approach to Mathematical Cognition, where in the introduction, there's some beautiful dis discussion of mathematics. And uh, you reference there uh, Tristan Needham, who criticizes a narrow form of view of mathematics by likening the studying of mathematics as symbol manipulation to studying music without ever hearing a note. So from that perspective, what do you think is mathematics? What is this world of mathematics like? Well, I think of mathematics as um, a set of tools for exploring idealized worlds that um, often turn out to be extremely relevant to the real world, but need not. Um, but there are worlds in which objects exist with idealized properties. and in which the relationships among them can be characterized with precision so as to allow the implications of certain facts to then allow you to derive other facts with certainty. So, you know, if uh, you have two triangles and you know that there is um, uh, an angle in the first one that has the same measure as an angle in the second one, and you know that the lengths of the sides adjacent to that angle in each of the two triangles, uh, the corresponding sides adjacent to that angle are also have the same measure, then you can then conclude that the triangles are congruent, that is to say, they have all of their properties in common. And, and that is something about triangles. It's not a f matter of formulas. These are idealized objects. In fact, you know, we build bridges out of triangles and uh, we understand uh, how to measure the height of something we can't climb by um, extending these ideas about triangles a little further. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, all of the ability to um, get a tiny speck of matter launched from uh, the planet Earth to intersect with some tiny, tiny little body way out in, way beyond Pluto somewhere, at exactly a predicted time and date is, is is something that depends on these ideas, right? So, but and, and it's actually uh, happening in the real physical world that these ideas make contact with it uh, in those kinds of instances, um, and um, so, but you know there are these idealized objects, these triangles or these distances or these points, whatever they are, that um, uh, allow for this um, set of tools to be created that then gives human beings the, uh, it's this incredible leverage that they didn't have without these concepts. And uh, I think this is actually already true when we think about just, you know, the natural numbers. Um, I always like to include zero, so I'm going to say the, <laughs> the non-negative <laughs> integers, but <laughs> that's that's a place where some people prefer not to include zero, but... Uh, no, we like zero here. So natural <laughs> numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. Yeah. And, and you know, because they give you the ability to... Um, be exact about um, like how many sheep you have. Like, you know, I sent you out this morning. There were 
23 sheep, you came back with only 22. What happened, yeah. right? <laughs> the fundamental problem of physics, how many sheep you have, yeah. <laughs> it's a fundamental problem of- Life. Of human uh, society that you damn well better bring back the same number of sheep <laughs> as you started with. Uh, and, you know, it, it allows commerce, it allows um, contracts, it allows the establishment of uh, records and so on to have systems that allow these things to be notated. But they they have um, an inherent aboutness to them that's at, this one, at the one and the same time sort of abstract and idealized and generalizable while at the other, on the other hand, um, potentially very, very grounded and concrete. And one of the things that uh, makes for the um, incredible achievements of the human mind is the fact that humans invented these idealized systems that leverage the power of human thought in such a way as to allow all this kind of thing to happen. And, and so that's what mathematics to me is the development of systems for thinking about uh, the properties and relations among uh, sets of idealized objects and, um, uh, you know, the, the mathematical notation system that we unfortunately focus way too much on is um, just our way of expressing uh, propositions about these properties. Right. It's, it's just just like we're talking with Chomsky and language. It's the thing we've invented for the communication of those ideas. They're not necessarily the deep representation of those ideas. Yeah. So what um, what's a, what's a good way to model such powerful mathematical reasoning? Would you say what? What are some ideas you have for capturing this in a model? The insights that human mathematicians have had is a combination of the kind of the intuitive kind of connectionist like knowledge that makes it so that something is just like obviously true so that you don't have to think about why it's true, that then makes it possible to then take the next step and ponder and reason and figure out something that you previously didn't have that intuition about, it then ultimately becomes a part of the intuition that the next generation of mathematical thinkers have to ground their own thinking on so that they can extend the ideas even further. I came across this quotation uh, from Henri Poincaré while I was um, walking in the, in the woods with my wife in a, a state park in Northern California uh, late last summer. And what it said on the bench was, it is by logic that we prove, but by intuition that we discover. And so what what for me the the essence of the of the project is to understand how to bring the intuitive connectionist resources to bear on letting the intuitive discovery arise uh, you know from, engagement in thinking with this formal system. Mm -hmm. So I, I think of, you know, the ability of somebody like Hinton or Newton or Einstein or Rommel Hart or Poincaré to um, Archimedes, this is another example, right? So suddenly a flash of insight occurs it's it's like the constellation of all of these simultaneous constraints that somehow or other 
causes the mind to settle into a a novel state that it never did before and and give rise to a new idea um that you know then <laughs> you can say okay well now how can i prove this you know how do i write down the steps of that theorem that that allow me to make it rigorous and certain and so i feel like the the kinds of things that we're beginning to see um deep learning systems do of their own accord kind of gives me this feeling of of um i don't know hope or encouragement that ultimately um it'll all uh happen um so in, in particular as uh many people now have have uh, become really interested in thinking about you know neural networks that have been trained with massive amounts of text mm -hmm. can be given a prompt and they can then sort of generate some really interesting fanciful creative story from that prompt um and uh there's there's kind of like a sense that they've somehow synthesized something like novel out of the you know all of the particulars of all of the billions and billions of experiences that went into the training data that that gives rise to something like this sort of intuitive sense of what would be a a fun and interesting little story to tell or something like that it just sort of wells up out of the out of the letting the thing play out its own imagining of what somebody might say given this prompt as a as a input to to get it to to start to generate its own thoughts and and to me that that sort of represents the potential of capturing this the intuitive side of this yeah, and there's other examples. I don't know if you find them as captivating as you know on the deep mind side with alpha zero. If you study chess, the kind of solutions that it has come up in terms of chess, it it, it is, it it there's novel ideas there. It feels very uh, like there's brilliant moments of insight, and the mechanism they use. Uh, if you think of search as as maybe more towards good old fashioned AI. And, and then there's the connectionist uh, neural network that has the intuition of looking at a board, looking at a set of patterns and saying, how good is this set of positions? And the next few positions, how good are those? And that's it. And those, that's just an intuition. Um, yeah, yeah. Gra grandmasters have this and understanding positionally, tactically, how good the situation is, how, how can it be improved without doing this full like deep search. Um, and then maybe doing a little bit of the what uh, human chess players call calculation, which is the search, mm -hmm. uh, taking a particular set of steps down the line to see how they unroll. But there, there is moments of genius in those systems too. So that's another hopeful illustration that from neural networks can emerge this novel creation of an idea. Yes, and I think that you know, I think Demis Hassabis is, um, you know, he's spoken about those things. He, uh, I heard him uh, describe a, a move that was made in, in one of the Go matches against Lee Sedol in, this, in a very similar way. And, and um, it caused me to become really excited to <laughs> kind of collaborate with some of those guys at, at DeepMind. Um. So I think, though, that what, what I like to really emphasize here is one part of what I like to emphasize about mathematical cognition, at least, is that philosophers and logicians going back three or even a little more than 3,000 years ago began to develop these formal systems and gradually 
the whole idea about thinking formally got constructed. Um, and, you know, it's preceded Euclid, um, certainly present in the work of Thales and others. And I'm not uh, the world's leading expert in all the details of that history. But Euclid's elements were the the kind of the touch point of a of a coherent document that sort of laid out this idea of an actual formal system within which these objects were characterized and the um, the system of uh, inference that um, allowed new truths to be derived from others was sort of like established as a paradigm. And um, what, what I find interesting is the idea that the ability to become a person who is capable of thinking in this abstract formal way is you know, a result of the same kind of immersion uh, in, in experience thinking in that way that, you know, we now begin to think of our understanding of language as being, right? So we immerse ourselves in, in a particular language, in a particular world of objects and their relationships, and we learn to talk about that, and we develop intuitive understanding of the real world in in a similar way we can think that what academia has created for us what you know those early philosophers in their academies in Athens and Alexandria and others other places uh, allowed was the development of these uh, schools of thought modes of thought that that then become deeply ingrained and you know it it becomes what it is that makes it so that somebody like Jerry Fodor would think that um systematic thought is the essential characteristic of the human mind as opposed to a derived an, an acquired characteristic that results from acculturation in a certain mode that's been invented by humans. 